I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with author Carlo Armanese, who has written a masterful tale of the bizarre and unusual in his captivating collection, Footsteps in the Dark, Stories of the Bizarre and Unusual. We will dive into the depths of the human condition and explore the external struggle between good and evil. This author presents an intricate character study in each of his eight supernatural and horror sto short stories. He has a storytelling style that is reminiscent of the Twilight Zone. We're delighted to have Carlo in the spotlight today. We thank the folks at Authors Tranquility Press for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel. Carlo, thanks so much for being our guest today. It's my pleasure. I'll start out with my bad Rod Serling impression. Imagine, if you will, one Carlo Armanese, a man who has written a book complete of eight short stories, stories that will forever change your perspective. How's that? Okay. Pretty good. That's not, not bad, bad, right? Um, it's a holdover from high school. I've been impersonating him for a long time. Loved your book. It is reminiscent of the Twilight Zone uh, and that type of, you know, extraordinary encounter type story. How did you come up with these stories? Have they been cooking up here for a while? <clears throat> well, actually, I started writing Footsteps back in 2017, and I, I kind of sat down and said what I wanted to do was present a series of tales uh, focusing on good versus evil. Mm -hmm. And that each of the stories that I put together has that, that particular point of view. You know, the, the idea was to blend, I love supernatural, I love horror, and I love mystery. So this book kind of blends those three genres together. And that's kind of where I started. And it started with the first story, which was Conversation with Death. And out of that story inspired me to just continue on and keep adding to the collection. So uh, it was a labor of love right from the very beginning. Sounds great. Which is your favorite story of the eight? Conversation with Death. Yeah, first usually one your baby, your first one is your first yeah. love, right? Yeah. Yeah, tell, your fo tell the folks at home a little bit of what that story is about. Well, Conversation with Death is about a serial killer who ends up uh, killing the wife of a newlywed couple. And out of his desperation and his sadness, he decides he's going to go out and get the guy that got his wife, essentially. So for the rest of the story, he joins forces with an FBI agent and he tours across the country following the deaths and the killings of this killer. Mm -hmm. And through the process, he becomes more ingrained and determined that he's going to stop this guy because his killings are horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're very well depicted in the book. But he's determined that, you know, his wife suffered and he wants to make sure the killer suffers the same way. As he goes through this, what ends up happening is as he encounters each death, he becomes even more determined and starts to realize that he has to catch this guy. So one night on his way back from a crime scene, he happens to see in the distance uh, a, a, a small diner mm -hmm. and this diner. Had, had no reason to be where he was, but he goes to investigate. And when he goes into the diner to investigate, he comes in contact with a dead person, mm -hmm. somebody who's just been recently killed by this serial killer. And he can't figure out why he's able to be there and communicate with this killer. But through the process of the story, he meets a series of people killed by the killer who start to help him find the guy. And at the end of the story, he he does find the guy. But what happens at the end, each of my stories have a twist ending mm -hmm. uh, because I firmly believe that once you set up a story, you want to have it end in a way that, that kind of makes sense, but keeps the audience engaged as it goes forward. So in this particular case, just when he thinks he's got the killer and he's trapped him, he ends up being killed by the killer. And wow. that's how kind of where it all ends up in that way. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to, you want to lay out the story. You want it to be logical. You want it to follow to its logical conclusion. But sometimes the logical conclusion be, should be something the reader did not anticipate. Didn't expect. Exactly yeah. right. That's Absolutely. Exactly right. Sounds great. How long have you been writing? Is this your first effort? Uh, well, no, I've been writing for probably 40 years. Mm -hmm. The idea is, but I started out writing comedy. Uh, I didn't write to, 
footsteps or horror at the beginning. I started write, writing comedy and I've been writing that for a while. And then I moved into mystery and then finally came back into horror and supernatural. Uh, I'm kind of, I, I like to go where my desire goes when I write. In other words, instead of like most writers, they spend all their time writing in one particular genre. Mm -hmm. I have a tendency to start a story and wherever it takes me, it takes me. And if it turns out to be mystery, that's great. If it turns out to be comedy, that's also great. Uh, and in Footsteps, it kind of kind of combines those because there's a couple of comedic short stories in the book as well. Uh, so I, I kind of like to vacillate a little bit. Exactly. I like my comedy dark also. You know, I like the Coen brothers, that kind of stuff. You know, Absolutely. I find that truly funny. Bad Santa is one of the funniest movies around, I think. Uh, yes. You know, I love, you know, the, the bizarre take on life, the bizarre twist. Uh, to me, it's more real than somebody, you know, just trying to be funny. So uh, the book is amazing. Tell me a little bit about your work outside of writing. What did you do? What do you do to uh, pay the bills? Are you uh, retired? Are you still working? Or tell I, me a little I, about your I life. I'm retired, working part. Now just basically working full time as a writer. But right. I spent my career in, in uh, executive management in retail. Okay. I started working with Gucci. I was with Gucci for 17 years. Then I went to work with the North Face. And then mm -hmm. I worked for Coach. And I spent my life. But all along the time that I was with these companies, I was also writing. Right. So I just kept it going and kept it going. Um, and I think what happened is, as I was in retail, I got, I was, you know, able to come in contact with a lot of really interesting people, mm -hmm. which then actually helped me to develop characters as mm -hmm. I went forward. So it's been that combination of just being in the public eye that led me to uh, want to get back into writing full time. Wonderful, wonderful. Is this your first book you've had published? No, I've got four books that are out right now. Okay. Uh, Footsteps is was number one. Mm -hmm. and then I, I wrote a, uh, a, a a historical mystery called The Picture Box, mm -hmm. which is about Croatia. Uh, happened to have a neighbor living next to me here in Vegas, and he grew up in Croatia. And his family history was very interesting to me. They were well known in Croatia. And so out of that relationship with him came my next book, which was Foot Footsteps. Mm -hmm. And then I created a detective called Sam Razor. Sam Razor was a detective I created. And his first case is the blonde with the bad nose job. <laughs> and you see a uh, lot of that in Vegas. Yes, exactly right. <laughs> so Sam actually was his first case. Now I'm I'm in the middle now of his second case, which is the case of the black black backcourt blackmailer, uh, right. and then I have another mystery uh, in addition. So all four are on are out right now uh, online. So that's awesome. been, and I'm continuing to write as we go forward. Great, great. I'm intrigued by your Sam Razor uh, collection because I'm a huge fan of uh, noir, whether it's. Uh, you know, Philip Marlowe or Sam Spade, yeah. uh, any of those guys. Uh, I love the hard-boiled detective, uh, you know, the postman you, already, that, always rings twice kind of stuff. Yeah, and he's a little he's a little less hard-boiled, but he's he's competent, but in kind of a freaky sort of way. You know, he solves things almost in spite of himself. Uh, and his first case, The Blonde with the Bad Nose Job, kind of uh, exemplifies that all the way through the story. So you right. should get it and read it. Sounds great. Sounds great. And the blonde with the uh, bad the nose job. Bad nose, um, What's that? The blonde with the bad nose job. Right? Yeah, I love it. I mean, it reminds me a little bit, uh, like you said, you like a little bit dark comedy. Even the title is darkly comedic. I enjoyed yes. that very, very much. How long did it take you to uh, compile all of these stories that you uh, wrote for Footsteps? Uh, I would say I worked on Footsteps stories for probably close to a year. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, it, as a writer, I spent most of my time redoing and rewriting and yeah. editing myself and trying to make sure the story had the perfect positioning. You know, these stories are about good and evil. And that's the other thing that I believe in a great deal. I mean, when I wrote Footsteps, the idea was this collection of characters, which are identifiable to most people, uh, they all were willing to do whatever it took to get the things they wanted out of life, to achieve those desires. But the reality was they never really had any particular consideration for the ramifications of their actions. And so when they got what they wanted, they also got the ramifications of what they wanted as well. And that, I, I kind of believe that in life to some degree, 
you know, you can go out of your way to be evil and take advantage, but at some point it's the, the, the bills do, yeah. and you're going to end up paying for it. And that's kind of the way I position footsteps. Uh, so it was that compilation of people that are trying to do whatever was necessary to get what they wanted. Interesting. Yep. Interesting. Is there one story in there? I know your favorite is conversation with death, but is there one story in there you think would be most adaptable to become a movie or something? Well, hopefully what I kind of looked at it this way, that, that all the stories have kind of a, a, a movie quality to them essentially, mm -hmm. but the ones, another one of the stories um, is about a, I'm, I'm a firm believer in astral projection. While I was writing my book, I was studying a lot about astral projection or out of body experience. Okay. And one of the stories in my book is about a professor of astral projection. In fact, he teaches at the Institute for the Study of Astral Projection. And in his particular case, he's, he's teaching people how to, how to astral project. But the reason he's doing it is because he's dying of cancer. Hmm. And he's look in the, in the study of astral projection, the philosophy is that when you astral project, your second body, which is not your soul, but your second body uh, suspends from your physical body and you actually move about and go places. Now, there are a lot of people that believe this is true. And in fact, you know, it's it's they they think that they do it all the time. Well, in this particular guy's case, he teaches, but he's dying of cancer. So he's looking for a replacement body. Hmm. He's looking for somebody that he can teach the astral project so that while they're out of their body astral projecting, he can take over their body. And so that's what happens. That's the crux of the story. Right. And at the end, at the end, of course, he gets kind of realizes that he didn't do his due diligence. And the guy that he's trying to take over his body had a husband, had a wife and uh, the essentially had a husband. And so at the end of the day, he ends up being killed uh, <laughs> while he's in his second body. So exactly. that's, so that's again, one be I, careful what you wish for. Wish that's for. You exa might get your, that's uh, exactly right. That's exactly right. You might so, get your just desserts. I can actually see this um, becoming a series sort of like dark mirror that's kind of like yeah. the modern day twilight zone right yeah, exactly and yeah. that's the idea the idea was i created this series of stories and i'm working on another seven right now for mm -hmm. footsteps in the dark two with the same general philosophy that it's good versus evil uh one that i'm writing at the current thing is called the non-believer and it's all about the differences between people that believe in god and people who don't which is a kind of ongoing debate that's been going on since the beginning of time. And so the idea gets to be is really coming into wanting to focus on real, clear, identifiable messages that we all grapple with or enjoy, but at the same time, making them interesting enough that you kind of want to keep reading the next and the next and the next. Absolutely. How far along are you in that book so far? Um, I'm probably five stories into it already. Uh, and, uh, and, and like I said, I'm writing another Sam Razor case at the same time. So okay. I kind of go back and forth between horror, supernatural and comedy. That's keeping you busy for sure. Yeah. Do you face any challenges while creating your supernatural themes? Um, or do you feel that's just kind of a creative extension of uh, real life circumstances? Well, that's an interesting question because I, I'm already, when I'm writing it, I'm determined, I've already determined that it's real, mm -hmm. that, you know, we sit back and we question the, the, the reality of supernatural beings and supernatural situations. But as I start to write, I always write from a position that it's actually happening and it's actually happening to this particular person. So I don't, I kind of don't try to discount anything that I'm writing. I don't try to rationalize it in any particular way. Supernatural and horror has really become real popular mm -hmm. these days. A lot of people really, especially with horror these days, you know, as it is right now, that genre has become really popular. And Supernatural has always been popular. Look at the popularity of uh, Twilight Zone. Right. I mean, you, when you go into it with an understanding that you have, to dispo you have to suspend disbelief and you have to just take it for what it's worth and let it go, that's the way I write. I write with an understanding that I don't question the reality. I just present the the irrationality of it as real life. Exactly. And I think people want to be scared. They enjoy it for whatever psychological reason. They like the little thrill. They like the chills. It just has to be plausible enough that That's they right. can suspend their disbelief. 
That's right. That's right. And and identify with the characters. That was important for Footsteps was that each of the characters, each of the lead characters in each of the stories, you had to identify with them. You know, uh, one is about an actress that's getting old mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to get old anymore. She wants to stay young because she's a lot of competition for actresses as they get old from the younger actresses. So she's determined to stay young. And so she she goes out on a quest to find a, ra a way to stay young and she finds a drug that she starts to take. And, and this drug does keep her young, but what she realizes is that as she takes it more and more, it has an effect on her body and she starts to turn into a, a, uh, a monster. Mm. <laughs> and the only way she stays away from being that monster as she takes the drug. Right. But every time she takes the drug, she stays this monster longer and longer. Uh, and so at the end of the story, she completely gets to a point where she can't transform back into her normal self anymore because she's taken this drug too much. And so and the end of the end of that is really a, a, a really interesting story, too, because she she starts to realize that she's stuck in this point. And one of her actor friends that she's in love with, she can't be with him because she knows she's a monster. And he can't, you know, she couldn't even divulge to him that she's a monster. But as it turns out at the end of the story, he's also a monster. <laughs> he's also been taking this drug. And so collectively they're together now. At the That's end. great. That is very Twilight Zone-esque and uh, very literal and figurative as well. You know, yeah. I mean, for the price we pay for beauty, the price we pay for vanity. And again, you get kind of living in Vegas, you kind of see that side of life a little bit where a That's woman right. should be dressed a little bit differently or a guy should be dressed a little differently because uh, youth is passing them by, right? Yeah, we spend a lot of our time, I think, in my opinion, of course, as human beings, kind of, you know, looking for ways to improve our existence and whatever that way is. And many times we're willing to take the chances necessary to get to that point. But what we don't realize is that when we do it, there is a, an, an outcome that we're not prepared for. And I want that to be the gist of what Footsteps, no matter what iteration of the book I'm in, what Footsteps is all about. Uh, you know, because there's all kinds of stories out there and positionings that are true, really. A lot of people feel this way. Yeah. And so my characters have to be that way, too, that you can read the book and you can just identify with the characters and maybe get a little bit nervous or scared that you're kind of doing some of the same things they're doing. Uh, and it's going to come back to haunt you. Exactly. Are any of the characters or stories based on real life experiences for you? No, 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 not necessarily. Well, I, or I you guess take a little piece of this guy and a little piece of that guy and blend them yeah, together. It's based on, yeah. It's certainly based on personalities that I've come across in my, in my life. Uh, you got the, you know, the person, for instance, one of the stories is about a, a guy who's a bigot. Mm -hmm. And he hates everybody. He just hates everybody. And in his mind, the, the, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket because around him, everybody, we just let the country go to hell. And so he wants to get rid of everybody, everybody mm -hmm. that he doesn't agree with or he doesn't like. But at the end of the day, so he, he comes, it's called the deadly dream. And he has this dream. And in his dream, he creates a monster that starts to kill off these people that he wants to get rid of. And at the course, so, you know, there's a lot of bigots out there. There's a lot of people that have attitudes where they don't want to just give credit for be people being human beings. They want to judge mm -hmm. and make sure that at the end of the day, they get their way regardless. And I think that that's a that's a message that I wanted to send with that particular story, that we're all human beings and we all have a right to be around. And we should take the time to get to know one another before we prejudge. Right. Well, that, I think that's a particularly fitting theme nowadays because of all the divisiveness in this country, with yes. all of the uh, reactionary uh, attitudes of people where, you know, America's not good anymore, this isn't any good anymore, things aren't how they used to be. Every generation feels that. Every right. generation to one level or another feels like, oh, things used to be better or things, it's not, it's more or less the same, things are changing, things are evolving, but, you know, That's right we're no worse in this generation than our parents thought this generation was going to be and that's, so on and so on. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. And if we just take a moment to listen uh, instead of judging, we can yeah. find out that there's good in a, in a lot of people and then there's evil in some people too. Right, right. You know, that's part of the lesson of life. That's a scary lesson of life is that true evil is out there. Yes. Yeah. Trying to take advantage of the situation. 
Yeah. Uh, and that was kind of the the genesis of Footsteps in the Dark was to present that collection of characters that for whatever reason are willing to do whatever they need to. And to realize that, you know, that kind of lives in all a, a lot of us. You know, we all have negative thoughts every once in a while. We just have to control them. Absolutely. Was there anything you wanted to write, but then you said, you know what, I, I can't go there. I can't write that. Well, no, I've never, I've never really stopped myself. If, if, if it took me over, if it was something that I had to say, because hopefully what ends up happening in my writing is I try to say something. Uh, and, and especially in the short stories, uh, it didn't, didn't stop me from writing. In fact, what's, what's come about now is it's come, I've come up with different ideas that I want to take advantage of, mm. you know, and I work a lot on titles. You know, I don't know how, how other authors actually move, but I go a lot by titles. I'll start with a title and let the title take me to the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and so at the end of the day, that gives me a lot of freedom, if you will. Um, and uh, I'm writing one now, right now called Suicide Farm, mm -hmm. was a, which is about a man who was, uh, whose wife died and he was taken to court and, and freed. He, was, he wasn't found guilty for killing his wife. So this one a journalist goes out to interview the guy because it was a big case in, in, the, in the news. And when he goes out to interview the guy, he, the guy operates a farm. He's a farmer. And as it turns out, his whole family has been killed. And nobody knew that. But he buries them all on his farm, his suicide farm. So I'll start with a title and then let it go from there if I can. That's very cool. That's very cool. A title is extremely important. I mean, people say you can't judge a book by its cover, right. but certainly people do pick out books by their covers and people do pick out books by their titles. That's right. And uh, it's kind of cool because you writing the title first almost makes it like a literary challenge. Right. Exactly. Like this, this is a great concept. This is a great title. These are the bones. Now, how do I fill in those bones? That's right. That's right. With the understanding that the message, I want to be the same. You know, the, the title kind of drives me in a direction, but the underlying message of good versus evil and what we do to get around things kind of just is pervasive. It kind of keeps going. So that's, yeah. that's kind of the way I work better. Were you inspired by the Twilight Zone? I was. Yeah, I was. Um, I, I thought Rod Serling was a genius. I mean, the way he presented those stories, and I thought the stories were great. I think, I think ultimately they were a little dated. Yeah. You know, they weren't they weren't real deep. I don't think the intention was in Twilight Zone to make deep stories, even though the cookbook. Mm -hmm. Remember the, the story yes. of the cook. Uh, how to that, serve man, right? How to serve man, exactly. Yes. Yeah. So stories like that, I, I had a real liking for because there was a a message there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I love the Twilight Zone. I think there were a few series out there that were kind of that way. Twilight Zone and what was the, the other one? Um, was Outer one? Limits. Outer Limits, yes. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. I love Alfred Hitchcock. All, all of that. Yeah, I loved it. Spent a lot of Saturday afternoons as a young man and kid watching that stuff. Rod yeah. Serling also wrote the original Planet of the Apes in 1968. Great movie. And it, it's one of my favorite movies of all time, but the screenplay is wonderful. You know, yeah. the actual story, it's better than the novel it's based on. It's based well, on all, a novel. And then and, all the subsequent Planet of the Ape movies too, yeah. where, you know, the more modern take on it, where the apes kind of take over and, and all of a sudden now. So yeah, that, those were fa fantastic. I love, I love stories like that. I like yeah. to watch as many of them as I can and then use it for inspiration. Exactly. Exactly. What films inspire you? Are there like a couple of movies that really like, you know, get the creative juices flowing? Uh, wow. I see a lot of movies. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately for me, though, a lot of what I see at the movies stays with me just a short time yeah. because I've moved on to the next movie, you know, and so they start to blend together the whole thing. The Rocky movies were always great. I loved right. I loved all of those. Uh, I'm not real big on a lot of the Halloween stuff. You might right. think that's since I like horror. Um, I don't like pervasive horror where it's just for the sake of killing a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, John Wick, this whole series of this movies yeah. that, that he's doing are really good. The only thing about John Wick is you start to realize very quickly he's killed half the United, half the United States. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What about the original... Um... 
not Dawn of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead was good. I like Night it's of the Living It's a classic, Dead. right? It's a classic. And it starts that whole genre of, you know, uh, the, the whole thing of, of how you approach the whole vampire and dead. The undead, and zombie. Yeah. It's kind of like the birth of the zombie movie. That's exactly right. I, I, those are good. I, yeah. I don't see myself writing a zombie movie, though. Uh, I'm right. just I'm interested in watching it. I'm not necessarily interested in, in, in writing it. Right. I want there to be more reality to my stories. You know, the zombie movies, uh, they're not they're good, but they're just not real to me. They, there's exactly. Not so I want something that's actually real that could possibly happen if you're not careful. Yeah, there was recently a zombie series on HBO Max, and I forget the title of it. Um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, I don't remember it either. But it was it's a huge hit, but I actually stopped watching it when the zombies showed up because uh, I can only suspend my disbelief so much. Right. I was like, oh, forget it. I don't want to watch a zombie movie. Some of them are entertaining, but I've had my fair share at this point. So right. uh, have you spent your whole life in Vegas? Tell me a little bit about you personally. Oh. I grew up in Illinois, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, went to a school in Chicago, and and, and uh, then I, when I got into retail, I started moving around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've lived in San Francisco, L.A., New York, uh, Boston, Vegas. Uh, I, because of my career, I, I had the opportunity. I was blessed enough to be able to move around the United States and be in different cities. So. Uh, uh, I ended up in Vegas because I was brought here as recruited here to run a company, a small company. And mm -hmm. that's what brought me here, even though I'd been in Vegas several times. Uh, but Vegas is, I think, the end. Yeah. Uh, or maybe not. My wife loves the heat. I don't. So I, <laughs> I'm going to have to figure that one out. Exactly. Well, at least start traveling in June and July when it's real hot there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Wonderful. Well, the name of the book is Footsteps in the Dark. Stories of the Bizarre and Unusual. It is reminiscent of the Twilight Zone series, but it is unique in its take. It is very modern, and the stories are very, very real with masterful twists at the end of each that will keep you guessing and keep you wanting more. And more are coming. Footsteps in the Dark 2 is coming. Carlo Armanese is the author. He's done a wonderful job both in writing those books and in conducting this interview with me today. Carlo, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you too, Logan. Thank you for having me. True I pleasure. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford. Thank you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.